Chapter Eleven of Different Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Different Girls, Harper's Novelettes, The Prize Fund Beneficiary by E. A. Alexander miss snell began to apologize for interrupting the work almost before she came in the painter who grudgingly opened one half of the folding door wide enough to let her pass into the studio was annoyed to observe that in spite of her apologies she was loosening the furs about her throat as if in preparation for a lengthy visit then for the first time behind her tall black-draped figure he caught sight of her companion who was shorter and whose draperies were of a less ample character for miss snell being tall and thin resorted to voluminous garments to conceal her slimness of person a large plumed hat accentuated her sallowness and sharpness of feature and her dark eyes set under heavy black brows intensified her look of unhealthy pallor she was perfectly at her ease and introduced her companion miss price in a few words explaining that the latter had come over for a year or so to study and was anxious to have the best advice about it so i brought her straight here miss snell announced triumphantly miss price seemed a trifle overcome by the novelty of her surroundings but managed to say in a high nasal voice that she had already begun to work at julian's but did not find it altogether satisfactory the painter looking at her indifferently was roused to a sudden interest by her face her features and complexion were certainly pleasing but the untidy mass of straggling hair topped by a battered straw sailor hat diverted the attention of a casual observer from her really unusual delicacy of feature and colouring she was tall and slim although now she was dwarfed by miss snell's gaunt figure a worn dress and shabby green cape fastened at the neck by a button hanging precariously on its last thread completed her very unsuitable winter attire outside the great studio window a cold december twilight was settling down over roofs covered with snow and icicles and the painter shivered involuntarily as he noticed the insufficiency of her wraps for such weather and got up to stir the fire which glowed in the big stove in one corner his model waited patiently for the guest to depart and he now dismissed her for the day eliciting faint protestations from miss snell who however was settling down comfortably in an easy chair by the fire with an evident intention of staying indefinitely miss price's large somewhat expressionless blue eyes were taking in the whole studio and the painter could feel that she was distinctly disappointed by her inspection she had evidently anticipated something much grander and this bare room was not the ideal place she had fancied the studio of a world-renowned painter would prove to be bare painted walls a peaked roof with a window reaching far overhead a polished floor one or two chairs and a divan the few necessary implements of his profession and many canvases faced to the wall but little or no bric-a-brac or delightful studio properties the painter was also conscious that her inspection included him personally and was painfully aware that she was regarding him with the same feeling of disappointment she quite evidently thought him too young and insignificant-looking for a person of his reputation 
miss snell had not given him time to reply to miss price's remark about her study at julian's but prattled on about her own work and the unsurmountable difficulties that lay in the way of a woman's successful career as a painter i have been studying for years under blank said miss snell and really i have no time to lose it will end by my simply going to him and saying quite frankly now monsieur blank i have been in your atelier for four years and i can't afford to waste another minute there are no two ways about it you positively must tell me how to do it you really must not keep me waiting any longer i insist upon it how discouraging it is she sighed it seems quite impossible to find any one who is willing to give the necessary information miss price's wandering eyes had at last found a resting-place on a large half-finished canvas standing on an easel something attractive in the pose and turn of her head made the painter watch her as he lent a feeble attention to miss snell's conversation miss price's lips were very red and the clear freshness of extreme youth bloomed in her cheeks she was certainly charming during one of miss snell's rare pauses she spoke and her thin high voice came with rather a shock from between her full lips may i look was her unnecessary question for her eyes had never left the canvas on the easel since they had first rested there she rose as she spoke and went over to the painting the painter pulled himself out of the cushions on the divan where he had been lounging and went over to push the big canvas into a better light then he stood while the girl gazed at it saying nothing and apparently oblivious to everything but the work before him he was roused not by miss price who remained admiringly silent but by the enraptured miss snell who had also risen gathering furs and wraps about her and was now ecstatically voluble in her admiration english being insufficient for the occasion she had to resort to french for the expression of her enthusiasm the painter said nothing but watched the younger girl who turned away at last with a sigh of approbation he was standing under the window leaning against a table littered with paints and brushes stay where you are exclaimed miss snell excitedly is he not charming cora in that half light you must let me paint you just so some day you must indeed she clutched miss price and turned her forcibly in his direction the painter confused by this unexpected onslaught moved hastily away and busied himself with a pretence of clearing the table i i should be delighted he stammered in his embarrassment and he caught miss price's eye in which he fancied a smile was lurking but you have not given miss price a word of advice about her work said miss snell as she fastened her wraps preparatory to departure she seemed quite oblivious to the fact that she had monopolized all the conversation herself he turned politely to miss price who murmured something about julian's being so badly ventilated but gave him no clue as to her particular branch of the profession miss snell however supplied all details it seemed miss price was sharing miss snell's studio having been sent over by the lynxville massachusetts sumner prize fund for which she had successfully competed and which provided a meagre allowance for two years study abroad she wants to paint heads said miss snell and in reply to a remark about the great amount of study required to accomplish this desire surprised him by saying oh she only wants to paint them well enough to teach not well enough to sell i'll drop in and see your work some afternoon promised the painter warmed by their evident intention of leaving and he escorted them to the landing warning them against the dangerous steepness of his stairway which wound down in almost murky darkness 
ten minutes later the centre panel of his door displayed a card bearing these words at home only after six o'clock i wonder i never thought of doing this before he reflected as he lit a cigarette and strolled off to a neighbouring restaurant i am always out by that hour several weeks elapsed before he saw miss price again for he promptly forgot his promise to visit her studio and inspect her work his own work was very absorbing just then and the short winter days all too brief for its accomplishment he was struggling to complete the large canvas that miss snell had so volubly admired during her visit and it really seemed to be progressing but the weather changed suddenly from frost to thaw and he woke one morning to find little runnels of dirty water coursing down his window and dismally dripping into the muddy street below it made him feel blue and his big picture which had seemed so promising the day before looked hopelessly bad in this new mood so he determined to take a day off and after his coffee strolled out into the luxembourg gardens there the statues were green with mouldy dampness and the paths had somewhat the consistency of very thin oatmeal porridge suddenly the sun came out brightly and he found a partially dry bench where he sat down to brood upon the utter worthlessness of things in general and the luxembourg statuary in particular the sunny facade of the palace glittered in the brightness one of his own pictures hung in its gallery it is bad he said to himself hopelessly bad and he gloomily felt the strongest proof of its worthlessness was its popularity with the public he would probably go on thinking this until the weather or his mood changed as his eyes strayed from the palace he glanced up a long vista between leafless trees and muddy grass plats a familiar figure in a battered straw hat and scanty green cloak was advancing in his direction the wind blowing back the fringe of disfiguring short hair disclosed a pure unbroken line of delicate profile strangely simple and recalling the profiles in botticelli's lovely fresco in the louvre miss price for it was she carried a painting-box and under one arm a stretcher that gave her infinite trouble whenever the wind caught it as she passed the painter half started up to join her but she gave him such a cold nod that his intention was nipped in the bud he felt snubbed and sank back on his bench taking a malicious pleasure in observing that woman-like she ploughed through all the deepest puddles in her path making great splashes about the hem of her skirt that fluttered out behind her as she walked for her hands were filled and she had no means of holding it up the painter resented his snubbing he was used to the most humble deference from the art students of the quarter who hung upon his slightest word and were grateful for every stray crumb of his attention he now lost what little interest he had previously taken in his surroundings just before him in a large open space reserved for the boys to play handball was a broken sheet of glistening water reflecting the blue sky the trees rattled their branches about in the wind and now and then a tardy leaf fluttered down from where it had clung desperately late into the winter the gardens were almost deserted it was too early for the throng of beribboned nurses and howling infants who usually haunt its benches one or two pedestrians hurried across the garden evidently taking the route to make short cuts to their destinations and not for the pleasure of lounging among its blustery attractions after idling an hour on his bench he went to breakfast with a friend who chanced to live conveniently near and where he made himself very disagreeable by commenting unfavourably on the work in progress and painting in particular 
then he brushed himself up and started off for the rue notre dame des champs where miss snow's studio was situated it was one of a number huddled together in an old and rather dilapidated building and the porter at the entrance gave him minute directions as to its exact location but after stumbling up three flights of dark stairs he had no trouble in finding it for miss snell's name preceded by a number of initials shone out from a door directly in front of him as he reached the landing he knocked and for several minutes there was a wild scurrying within and a rattle and clash of crockery then miss snell appeared at the door and exclaimed in delighted surprise how do you do we had quite given you up she looked taller and longer than ever swathed in a blue painting apron and grasping her palette and brushes she had to apologize for not shaking hands with him because her fingers were covered with paint that had been hastily but ineffectually wiped off on a rag before she answered his knock he murmured something about not coming before because of his work but she would not let him finish saying intensely we know how precious every minute is to you miss price came reluctantly forward and shook hands she had evidently not been painting for her fingers were quite clean short ragged hair once more fell over her forehead and the painter felt a shock of disappointment and wondered why he had thought her so fine when she passed him in the morning i was just going to paint cora announced miss snell she is taking a holiday this afternoon and we were hunting for a pose when you knocked don't let me interrupt you he said smiling perhaps i can help miss snell was in a flutter at once and protested that she should be almost afraid to work while he was there in that case i shall leave at once he said but his chair was comfortable and he made no motion to go what a queer little place it is he reflected as he looked about all sorts of odds and ends stuck about helter-skelter and the housekeeping things trying to masquerade as a bric-a-brac cora price looked decidedly sulky when she realized that the painter intended to stay and seeing this he became rooted in his intention he wondered why she took this particular attitude towards him and concluded she was piqued because of his delay in calling she acted like a spoiled child and caused miss snell who was overcome by his condescension in staying no little embarrassment it was quite evident from her behaviour that miss price was impressed with her own importance as the beneficiary of the lynxville prize fund and would require the greatest deference from her acquaintances in consequence here cora try this said miss snell planting a small three-legged stool on a rickety model stand might i make a suggestion said the painter coolly i should push back all the hair on her forehead it gives a finer line why of course said miss snell i wonder we never thought of that before cora dear you are much better with your hair back cora said nothing but the botticelli profile glowered ominously against a background of sage green which miss snell was elaborately draping behind it if i might advise again the painter said i would take that down and paint her quite simply against the grey wall miss snell was quite willing to adopt every suggestion she produced her materials and a fresh canvas and began making a careful drawing which as it progressed filled the painter's soul with awe i feel awfully like trying it myself he said after watching her for a few moments can i have a bit of canvas take anything exclaimed miss snell and he helped himself refusing the easel which he wanted to force upon him and propping his little stretcher up on a chair miss snell stopped her drawing to watch him commence it made her rather nervous to see how much paint he squeezed out on the palette it seemed to her a reckless prodigality 
he eyed her assortment of brushes dubiously selecting three from the draggled limp collection cora was certainly a fine subject in spite of her sulkiness and he grew absorbed in his work and painted away with miss snell at his elbow making little staccato remarks of admiration as the sketch progressed suddenly he jumped up realizing how long he had kept the young model dear me he cried you must be exhausted and he ran to help her down from the model stand she did look tired and miss snell suggested tea which he stayed to share cora became less and less sulky and when at last he remembered that he had come to see her work she produced it with less unwillingness than he had expected he was rather floored by her productions as far as he could judge from what she showed him she was hopelessly without talent and he could only wonder which of these remarkably bad studies had won for her the lynxville sumner prize fund he tried to give her some advice and was thanked when she put her things away then they all looked at his sketch which miss snell pronounced too charming and cora plainly thought did not do her justice i wish you would pose a few times for me miss price he said before leaving i should like very much to paint you and it would be doing me a great favour the girl did not respond to this request with any eagerness he fancied he could see she was feeling huffy again at his meagre praise of her work miss snell however did not allow her to answer but rapturously promised that cora should sit as often as he liked and paid no attention to the girl's protest that she had no time to spare this has been simply inspiring said miss snell as she bade him good-bye and he left very enthusiastic about cora's profile and with his hand covered with paint from miss snell's doorknob in spite of miss snell's assurance that cora would pose the painter was convinced that she would not if a suitable excuse could be invented feeling this he wrote her a most civil note about it the answer came promptly and did not surprise him she was very sorry indeed but she had no leisure hours at her disposal and although she felt honoured she really could not do it this was written on flimsy paper in a big unformed handwriting and it caused him to betake himself once more to miss snell's studio where he found her alone cora was at julian's she promised to beg cora to pose and accepted an invitation for them to breakfast with him in his studio on the following sunday morning he carefully explained to her that his whole winter's work depended upon cora's posing for him he half meant it having been seized with the notion that her type was what he needed to realize a cherished ideal and he told this to miss snell and enlarged upon it until he left her rooted in the conviction that he was hopelessly in love with cora a fact she imparted to that young woman on her return from julian's cora listened very placidly and expressed no astonishment he was not the first by any means other people had been in love with her in lynxville massachusetts and she confided the details of several of these love affairs to miss snell's sympathetic ears during the evening meanwhile the painter did nothing and a fresh canvas stood on his easel when the girls arrived for breakfast on sunday morning the big unfinished painting was turned to the wall he had lost interest in it when i fancy doing a thing i am good for nothing else he explained to cora after she had promised him a few sittings so you are really saving me from idleness by posing cora laughed and was silent the painter blessed her for not being talkative her nasal voice irritated him although her beautiful features were a constant delight miss snell had succeeded in permanently eliminating the disfiguring bang and her charming profile was left unmarred i want to paint you just as you are 
he said and noticing that she looked rather disdainfully at her shabby black cashmere added the black of your dress could not be better we thought said miss snell deprecatingly that you might like a costume we could easily arrange one not in the least necessary said the painter i have set my heart on painting her just as she is the girls were disappointed in his want of taste they had had visions of a creation in which two liberty scarves and a velveteen table cover were combined in a felicitous harmony of colour when can i have the first sitting he asked tuesday i think said miss snell reflectively heavens thought the painter is miss snell coming with her and the possibility kept him in a state of nervousness until tuesday afternoon when cora appeared accompanied by the inevitable miss snell it turned out however that the latter could not stay she would call for cora later just now her afternoons were occupied she was doing a pastel portrait in the champs elysees quarter so she reluctantly left to the painter's great relief he did not make himself very agreeable during the sittings which followed he was apt to get absorbed in his work and to forget to say anything then miss snell would appear to fetch her friend and he would apologize for being so dull and cora would remark that she enjoyed sitting quietly it rested her after the noise and confusion at julian's if she talked much i could not paint her her voice is so irritating he confided to a friend who was curious and asked all sorts of questions about his new sitter the work went well but slowly for cora sat only twice a week she felt obliged to devote the rest of her time to study as she was living on the prize fund and she even had qualms of conscience about the two afternoons she gave up to the sittings during all this time miss snell continued to weave chapters of romance about cora and the painter and the girls talked things over after each sitting when they were alone together spring had appeared very early in the year and the public gardens and boulevards were richly green chestnut trees blossomed and gaudy flower beds bloomed in every square the salons opened and were thronged with an enthusiastic public although the papers as usual denounced them as being the poorest exhibitions ever given the painter had sent nothing being completely absorbed in finishing cora's portrait to the utter exclusion of everything else cora did the exhibitions faithfully it was one of the duties she owed to the lynxville fund and which she diligently carried out the painter bothered and confused her by many things he persistently admired all the pictures she liked least and praised all those she did not care for she turned pale with suppressed indignation when he differed from her opinion and resented his sweeping contempt of her criticisms on the strength of a remittance from the prize fund and in honour of the season she discarded the sailor hat for a vivid ready-made creation smacking strongly of the bon marche the weather was warm and cora wore mitts which the painter thought unpardonable in a city where gloves are particularly cheap the mitts were probably fashionable in lynxville massachusetts miss snell who rustled about in stiff black silk and bugles seemed quite oblivious to her friend's want of taste she was all excitement for her pastel portrait by some hideous mistake had been accepted and hung in one of the exhibitions and the girls went together on varnishing day to see it there they met the painter prowling aimlessly about and miss snell was delighted to note his devotion to cora it was a strong proof of his attachment to her she thought the truth was he felt obliged to be civil after her kindness in posing he wished he could repay her in some fashion but since his first visit to miss snell's she had never offered to show him her work again or asked his advice in any way 
and he felt a delicacy about offering his services as a teacher when she gave him so little encouragement he fancied too that she did not take much interest in his work and knew she did not appreciate his portrait of her which was by far the best thing he had ever done her lack of judgment vexed him for he knew the value of his work and every day his fellow painters trooped in to see it and were loud in their praises it would certainly be the clue of any exhibition in which it might be placed during one sitting cora ventured to remark that she thought it a pity he did not intend to make the portrait more complete and suggested the addition of various accessories which in her opinion would very much improve it it's by far the most complete thing i have ever done he said i shan't touch it again and he flung down his brushes in a fit of temper she looked at him contemptuously and putting on her hat left the studio without another word and for several weeks he did not see her again then he met her in the street and begged her to come and pose for a head in his big picture which he had taken up once more his apologies were so abject that she consented but she ceased to be punctual and he never could feel quite sure that she would keep her appointments sometimes he would wait a whole afternoon in vain and one day when she failed to appear at the promised hour he shut up his office and strolled down to the seine there he caught sight of her with a gay party who were about to embark on one of the little steamers that ply up and down the river he shook his fist at her from the quay where he stood and watched her and her party step into the boat from the pier she thinks little enough of the lynxville prize fun when she wants an outing he said to himself scornfully after fretting a little over his wasted afternoon he forgot all about her and set to work with other models then he left paris for the summer a few hours after his return early in the fall there came a knock at his door he had been admiring cora's portrait which to his fresh eye looked exceptionally good miss snell with eyes red and tearful stood on his doormat when he answered the tap poor dear cora she said had received a notice from the lynxville committee that they did not consider her work sufficiently promising to continue the fund another year she will have to go home sobbed miss snell but said i am forced to admit that cora has wasted a good deal of time this summer she is so young and needs a little distraction now and then and she appealed to the painter for confirmation of this undoubted fact he was absent-minded but assented to all she said in his heart he thought it a fortunate thing that the prize fund should be withdrawn one female art student the less he grew pleased with the idea cora had ceased to interest him as an individual and he considered her only as one of an obnoxious class i thought you ought to be the first to know about it said miss snell confidentially because you might have some plan for keeping her over here miss snell looked unutterable things that she did not dare to put into words she made the painter feel uncomfortable she looked so knowing and he became loud in his advice to send cora home at once pack her off he cried she is wasting time and money by staying she never had a particle of talent and the sooner she goes back to lynxville the better miss snell shrank from his vehemence and wished she had not insisted upon coming to consult him she had assured cora that the merest hint would bring matters to a crisis cora would imagine that she had bungled matters terribly and she was mortified at the thought of returning with the news of a repulse as soon as she had gone the painter felt sorry he had been so hasty he had bundled her unceremoniously out of the studio pleading important work he called twice in the rue notre dame des champs but the porter would never let him pass her lodge and he at last realized that she had been given orders to that effect 
a judicious tip extracted from her the fact that miss price expected to leave for america the following saturday and armed with an immense bouquet he betook himself to the st lazare station at the hour for the departure of the havre express he arrived with only a minute to spare before the guard's whistle was answered by the mosquito-like pipe that sets the train in motion the botticelli profile was very haughty and cold miss snell was there of course bathed in tears he had just time enough to hand in his huge bouquet through the open window before the train started he caught one glimpse of an angry face within when suddenly his great nosegay came flying out of the compartment and striking him full in the face spread its shattered paper and loosened flowers all over the platform at his feet end of the prize fund beneficiary by e a alexander End of Different Girls, Harper's Novelettes